Come on, take it over, brother. It's all good. I think it is. Sounds like it is. Good morning. How are you guys today? Good, good, good. Father, I scratch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If you were to withdraw your spirit from me, where shall this servant go? Why don't you put your hands together for Jesus in this place today? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come on. He is the king of the universe. If he's really done anything for you, why don't you stand on your feet and put your hands together for him? If he's your Lord and Savior, put your hands together for him. If he's kept you all week, put your hands together for him. Amen. And why don't you just remain standing and grab your word, if you would, please. We're going to be going to the book of Romans. The book of Romans, chapter 12. And we're going to be reading today verses 1 and 2. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Romans, chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. If you got to say amen. amen. If you're still looking, say mercy. mercy. We'll wait for you. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I think I am reading from the King James Version of Scripture today. And there you will find these words. <clears throat> I beseech you, therefore, brethren... By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living, somebody say living, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You may be seated. I want to talk to you very briefly today from a topic called a posture of surrender. A posture of surrender. It was, uh, I assume now, about six or seven months ago, my family and I were in the biggest crisis or the biggest storm we had ever faced as a family. We were in the midst of a storm. Everything that we knew, everything that we had become accustomed to had changed. And it was almost as if it changed overnight. We were in a storm. Things were not as they used to be. Things were, were, were very difficult, and, and, and my wife and I had... We had prayed, we had, we had sought the face of God, we, we had laid before God day and night, but still things were not changing. It was a very difficult time for us. And then in the midst of that, in the midst of, in the midst of that storm one day, I was speaking with my wife and 
She was pouring out her heart. We were both frustrated. We were, we were both uh, in the midst of frustration. Has anybody ever been there? I know New Life is a perfect church, but I, but I probably got one or two people that know what frustration is. And we were there, and my wife was pouring out her heart, and, and she was telling me uh, how she felt. And when she finished, I, I paused for a moment, and then I said, you know what? This is what I told her. Don't worry, baby. I'm going to fix this. Don't, don't. Don't worry, I, I, I will take care of it. And very lovely, not in a mean way, not trying to hurt me, but, but she looked at me in a very loving way and she said, Jerome, she said, if you had the ability to fix it, she said, you would have done it already. And in that moment, in that time span, I realized that I had pushed God off of the throne and I had put Jerome Payne on the throne. What's, have you ever been there? Have you, have you ever pushed him off the throne? God, what's, what's taking you so long? Move over, God. I, I got this. You don't know what you're doing. You, you are taking too long. This... You are delaying it, God. Don't you see my pain? Don't you see what we're going through? Don't you understand our issues? God, what's, what's taking you so long? Move out of the way. I'm, I'm going to take over this place. I'm going to take over the throne. And I tried. I don't know if you know this about men, but, but we try to fix problems. That's one of the reasons women get so frustrated with us because they come and they, they just want someone to hear their heartbeat. But we can't listen because while you're talking, we're trying to fix your issue. We're trying to fix your problem because that's what we do. And any time a man finds himself in a spot and he has a problem that he can't fix. It is frustration to no end. And that's where I found myself. I found myself so frustrated. I found myself doing this to God. I found myself saying, God, you are not who you said you were. God, you have disappointed me. And that's where I was. God all for the throne and me on it. And I'm glad for the Apostle Paul in our text today because, because he begins to, to give us some insight into how a person, how an individual can, can, can prevent themselves from putting themselves on the throne that, that is rightfully God's spot. So, so Paul begins to deal with this issue. You have to understand Paul, he is, he is confusing at times. He, he, is a, he is a difficult person to, to put your finger on. You know, some people you can figure out, but, but Paul is one of those people who, he's difficult. He is a, he is a man's man. He is a... Uh, 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 a gladiator type of a guy. He, he, he's able to deal with extreme hardships. He's, he, is a, he is a man's man. He, he is, a, if you're not careful, you'll kind of walk away thinking this man is a machine. He's not human. He's a machine. But then, every once in a while, Paul would drop his guard. And you get to see that he's human, just like you and I. You get to see that he'll say stuff like, the good that I, that I want to do, I, I do not. And the, and the evil that I don't want to do, that, that, I, that I end up doing. And you realize, yes, yes Paul, you, you, you are human. You, you struggle just like all of us who, 
who are trying to be conformed to the, to the image of Christ. It is a, it is a struggle. So Paul begins to, to dive in in the, in the book of Romans is a, is a important piece of literature. It is, it is uh, perhaps the, the greatest piece of literature that God has given one of his servants. In this book, he lays out topics like justification and sanctification. He, he talks and he, not only do he lay it out, but he puts it in a very systematic way that, that makes it easy for us to, to understand. So Paul is, is writing this book and he's writing it from the city of Corinth. And he's writing it in the, in the home of a very wealthy friend of his. And he's, he's dealing with theology. For 11 chapters, Paul pounds it. He lays out all of these cases for 11 chapters. And then, when he gets to chapter 12, all of a sudden he makes a transition. He moves from doctrine to duty. He moves from, from belief to behavior. And he begins to, to lay the text out in chapter 12, and he, and he starts out and he says, I beseech you. That's a weird word. <laughs> How many of you use that every day? <laughs> hey, I beseech you, brother. That's, that's, that's not a word we use today, right? But what he's saying is that he's saying, I exhort you. I, I urgently listen to me. I, I entreat you. It's, it gives you the picture almost as if Paul is on his knees begging, listen, listen to me, listen to what I'm about to tell you. He says, I beseech you. Then he says, therefore, and what he's doing now is connecting everything that he has said in the prior 11 chapters, he's now connecting that. He says, therefore, in light of by the mercies of God. What are God's mercies? What, 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 what is his mercies? His, his mercy is reflected in his power of salvation. His, his mercy is displayed in his great kindness for us. His, his mercy is displayed in the forgiveness of our sins. His mercy is displayed in reconciliation, justification. We have received Divine sonship, that's God's mercy. We have the mercy of faith and hope, that's God's mercy. We have shared righteousness with Christ, that's the mercies of God. He says, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God. And then he says, look, there are four acts, four responses that you should have to God's mercies. He said, because God has been so kind, there's four things that you need to do. The first thing is presentation. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Have you ever thought about a living sacrifice? Oh, I get the concept of a dead sacrifice. I understand it. You kill an animal, you put it on the altar, it has no choice. It lays there until you sacrifice it, but a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice has the, the ability to say yes, and a living sacrifice has the ability to say no. God says, I demand a living sacrifice. We're under a new covenant now. 
animals and goats and bulls won't do. But he says, what I want is your life. Don't get caught up in the word sacrifice. This is what he's really saying. I want you to live for me day by day. Each day that you get up, I want you to sacrifice your life to me, your Lord and your Savior. I want you to be a, I want you to be a living sacrifice. No, God, no, don't make me get up on your altar. Please, God, I, I got my own agenda. I, I got what I want to do, but God says, you have to be a living sacrifice for me. A living. It has the idea of to bring before. But not only do you bring your life before him, but it also has another idea, to abide. But not only to abide, but it has a third concept, to continue. So I bring my life as a living sacrifice. I abide in your presence. Day by day, I continue in your presence. And when he's talking about body, he's just not talking about your physical being, but he's talking about your mind, body, and spirit. Every single part of you has to get up on God's altar. He wants your emotions. He, he wants your intellect. He wants your five senses. He, he wants everything that's, that's a part of you. He, he wants it on the altar. And then he says this. That's a reasonable request. It's not unusual. Uh, <clears throat> my brother-in-law is here today. He's a fire captain at Station 5 here in Columbia, Tennessee. Some years back, they got a call. House was on fire. So they rushed to the scene. Uh, when they got on the scene, <clears throat> they find out that a lady was still inside of the home. The husband had managed to escape but his wife was still inside of the house, house burning. My brother-in-law said somebody had to go in and get her. So he crawled through the window of the home. He said when he got inside, smoke was everywhere. He said he couldn't see anything, couldn't see his hand in front of him. So he got down on the ground, on the floor in the house, and he said he began to crawl and just reach out and start to, to feel. He said he just kept going through the house, crawling and feeling. Finally, he felt what he knew was a, was a body because it was, it was warm. And so he grabbed this lady and pulled her to safety out of this burning house. He, big news, big article in the local newspaper about it, got a proclamation from the mayor here, got little medals and all of that good stuff, and I was sitting, talking to him about it now, and I said, so, <clears throat> what do you think of all of this? He said, well, I was just doing my job. So it's my duty. As a fireman, when I put on that fireman suit, it's my duty. It's not unreasonable for you to ask a fireman on occasion to go into a burning house or a burning building to rescue someone that's on the inside. That's not an unreasonable request. God, in the spirit of our text today, he's saying the same thing to us. It's not unreasonable in light of what Paul has laid out in the prior 11 chapters, 
it's not unreasonable for me to ask you to be a living sacrifice. As a matter of fact, he says, that is your reasonable service. And that word service uh, is really better translated worship. It is your reasonable worship. This is the this is the least that you can do. So Paul said there's four acts. The first one is presentation, presenting your bodies. The second is separation. Be not conformed to this world. And really what he's saying is that word world is, is better translated age or this period of time. Be not conformed to this period of time. When you conform something, you actually shape it into a pattern. Do not allow yourself to be shaped into the pattern of this age, this time frame that we live. Do, do not allow yourself to be uh, uh, conformed to that pattern. Why? Here's why. The world system or this age, is a, it, is a, it is a system without God. It is a, it is a, it is a wicked system. And God says, I'm not in it. That's why he says, come out and be ye separate. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Because he says, it is an age in a, in a system that I am not a part of. It is the world's system. And God says, don't, don't be conformed to that pattern. And then he says this, he says, be ye transformed. A transformation has to take place in it. It is to be changed. It is a metamorphosis, if you will. It is a, a complete change. But the only way a person can be transformed is by the renewing of your mind. Listen at this. This is what they found. They found out that thought patterns actually creates in your brain, thought patterns actually create tracks or grooves in your brain. And this is what happened. After you think a certain way for so long, you are on automatic pilot because the grooves and the tracks have been created in your mind. Watch this. If you if you got a gallon of ice cream in your refrigerator and you sit and for hours you think about it, oh man, that's my, that's my favorite flavor. <laughs> oh man, I love you. You know, that ice cream, that ice cream should sure be good right now. And if you continuously think about it, guess what? Eventually, you will have that ice cream out on your counter with the biggest spoon you can find in your kitchen, and you will eat that ice cream to your heart's content. But then, guess what happens? Now, when you go to the grocery store, you no longer even think about, is this good for me? Because the pattern, the tracks, the grooves have been laid, and now you don't, you don't even think about it anymore. You just go and you get a half gallon of ice cream and in two days it's gone and you repeat the cycle again. And I'm using ice cream as the example, but it really applies to anything that we consistently think about, anything that we consistently do. You create these habits and these tracks and the Bible says that your mind has to be what? It has to be transformed 
But you, your mind has to be renewed. What does that mean? How, how does a person renew their mind? Well, the word actually means to, to renovate. So it means to, so it means to, I got to go in, and it's hard work, because here's the problem. Some of you right now today have tracks in your brain that was laid when you were a child. Your coach, your teacher, perhaps your mother or your father said something to you and you believed it and you, and you concentrated on that thought and now you have these tracks and grooves that are laid in your brain and your mind needs to be renovated. Some of you have had issues with relationships. You had one bad relationship and now you think every man is bad. Your mind needs to be renovated. Uh, somebody's, somebody's father, some man sitting in this audience today did not have a good connection with his father and now it impacts every single relationship that he has. Your mind needs to be renovated. And you got to go in and you got to take up the old tracks and you got to lay new tracks. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me a new track. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want a, a new track. God is love, a, a, a new track. He would never leave me nor forsake me a, a new track. I have, to, I have to lay a new track. So I have to renew my mind, renovate. And then here's the last thing that Paul says. He says you have presentation, presenting your body, separation, pulling away from the world, transformation, the renewing of your mind, and then finally, there is demonstration. So now, I have to prove that the will of God is good and perfect and the best thing for me. I have to prove it. I have to now demonstrate that God's will is holy. Here is, and I'm almost finished, here is the problem. As we go through life, we carry so much baggage. I, I know I look good to you guys standing up here with my nice jacket on, but I got baggage. And if the truth was really known, we all have baggage. I, I, I carried it around with me, the, the bags, and sometimes it's, it's not comfortable, but the bags of, of my life. And here, here, here is one from, from my childhood, and I carry it. I carry it with me. Here, here, here is one from a failed relationship that I had, and I I carry these, these bags and, and God is saying, look, it's in your benefit that you come before me each day. Sacrifice your life to me because I mean you good and not harm. And he says, look, in my presence, you can get rid of all of your, all of your baggage here. Hey, look at this one. This is, this is bad financial decisions. But in his presence, look at this one. You put the name on this one. 
Because I know you got some. What do you call it? Take it to him in his presence. In that act of sacrificing my life. And in that point where I, I come before him, I, I can lay out my stuff. I can, I can get free of, of my baggage. I can have my mind renovated. I can, I can walk away afresh. And God says, look, it's not a one-time act. But he says, come before me daily. Lay before me daily. And in that, I will take all of your bags. He says, this is what I do. He says, as I work on your heart, as I work on your spirit, as I give you a new mind, as I take you away from conforming to the world, he says, I'll take it. And he says, I will, I will take it. My mother don't love me. He said, I will take it. I will, the failed relationship with my father, I will uh, uh, get fired off a job. I will bad financial decisions. I will no, 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 no love in my family. I will. He says, I will take all of that stuff. And he says, I will throw it as far as the east is from the west. And I will remember it no more. God desires that we sacrifice our life. It is in your best interest. What are you holding on to? What is it that's so important that you can't give it to him? Is it your marriage? Is it a job? Is it some children? What are you refusing to give to God? He's saying, come and sacrifice your life. And he says, I will work it out. Get that stuff out of your heart and renovate your mind. May God bless you, and may God keep you. Thank you.